These are the notes on metallic bonds. We have a way of thinking about metallic bonds, a construct that we use, which makes them kind of easy to understand. It's called the electron C. I'm going to explain what that means. Now, it's important to realize that this is only a construct. This is a way for us understanding the way they behave, and it's sort of almost metaphorical. Okay, so keep that in mind. We've already discussed two of these three kinds of bonds. These are the principal types of bonds we have in chemistry. Ionic bonds, where you have a cation and an anion sticking together because of their opposite charges, forming a crystal structure ionic compound. And we saw covalent bonds, where you share electrons and form molecules. Now keep in mind, in covalent bonds, each one of those atoms is really, really pulling for those electrons. It's really, really trying to get a hold of those two electrons. The only reason they share isn't because they're polite or nice. It's because they can't manage to rip away those electrons from the other atom. And so they're forced to share because they're both pulling very strongly. Well, now that we understand a bit about both of those bonds, it makes metallic bonds much easier to understand. You can think of metallic bonds as being a little bit of each. It's kind of like metallic bonds have cations. That's one way we think about them, having cations, but no anions. That's interesting. And then it's kind of like metallic bonds share electrons, but not strongly. They share them weakly. In other words, every single one of those atoms in a metallic bond, which has to be a metal, of course, is not pulling very strongly on the electrons. And so because nobody's pulling very strongly, they're kind of not grabbed by anybody. They're sort of up for grabs. So that is the main difference between a metallic bond and a covalent bond and a metallic bond and an ionic bond. And of course, the easy thing about metallic bonds is they always form between two metals. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. That's really the best of the rules of thumb. So there's a little jar of potassium. So within that potassium, it's a bunch of different potassium atoms. They're kept under oil so they don't light on fire and explode. Um, between those potassium atoms, you have a metallic bond. So here's my simple breakdown of the three kinds of bonds. Metallic bonds, electrons are loosely shared, forming an electron C around the metal cations. Notice that's in quotes. Cations is in quotes, electron C is in quotes. That's our construct. I'll explain that in a moment. Ionic bonds, on the other hand, electrons are transferred, making cations and anions, which of course stick together because of their opposite charges in a salt crystal like sodium chloride. That's a good example. Then we saw covalent bonds, which are electrons are tightly shared between two atoms. Pairs of electrons are shared, making molecules. So covalent bonds generally make molecules. Well, they can also make polyatomic ions. That's another thing they can make. But for the most part, they make molecules. And metallic bonds don't. Ionic bonds don't. So don't go around saying molecule for everything. Because if you only have metals, you're not going to have any molecules. So remember the rules of thumb. Some of these rules of thumb are better than others. The one about the one on the right, the two nonmetals forming covalent bonds. That's true. That is true. But then there's other ways to make covalent bonds. So that's why I don't consider that a perfect rule of thumb. The middle one is the one with the biggest problems. A nonmetal and a metal form ionic bonds. Well, some nonmetals are a little bit lower with electronegativity, and some metals are a little higher. So if you put those together, they don't actually form ionic bonds. That is the rule of thumb that is broken the most. That's the broken thumb, the one in the middle. And then the best of these rules of thumb, the one that is almost always true, and at least we can consider it in a high school chemistry class as always being true, is that two metals form metallic bonds. That is going to be true. Okay, so that's the simplest one. And remember, it doesn't matter what their electronegativity is. If you have two metals, you can just assume it's going to be a metallic bond. So that saves us having to calculate. If we notice that both of the elements in a, forming a bond are metals, 
or even if it's two of the same metal, and there's a lot of metals on the periodic table, look at the diagram on the top, it's most of the periodic table, then you're going to get metallic bonds. So if you want to picture metallic bonds, this is the way we picture it. We picture them as cations. So for example, this is copper. Cu stands for copper. And we're picturing the copper as a positive 2 cation. Now, is the copper a positive 2 cation? Not really. We're talking about atoms of copper. But if you think about an atom, what is an atom really? An atom is sort of like the inner atom and then the valence electrons. Well, if you get rid of the valence electrons, all you're going to have left is a cation. So you can sort of think of the inner atom as a cation in every single atom. And then if you lose your valence electrons, then that's all you have left. So we like to think of the metal as being a cation so that we can picture its valence electrons as being shared between all the surrounding metals in every direction. The interesting thing about this is it sort of connects all the surrounding atoms very smoothly in a very smooth fashion, allowing them to share their valence electrons. We call this the electron C. Imagine an ocean of electrons. And I guess the cations would be the armada, the boats close together. This metaphor only work, gets you so far. Okay, so if you picture the valence electrons as being separate from the cation, then you can sort of see them as sort of a matrix filling up all the interstices between these cations. But really what we actually have are atoms, okay? So let me put a circle around a copper atom. Now you see the copper cation, but remember atoms are bigger than cations. That circle would have been the copper atom. That would include its valence electrons, and if it's got a positive two cation and you have two valence electrons added back in, well, guess what? You're back to an atom. So that would be the size of the atom. But let's look at the next one over. The next atom of copper, oh, look, it overlaps. And the next one, it overlaps as well. So because of this feature of metallic bonds, the overlap of the valence shells, it allows the metal to be very dense, to pack together very, very closely. Let me add some more. Let me add a few more of these. So notice that all of these neighboring atoms are overlapping their valence shell. It makes an even bigger difference than you can see here because, of course, it's going to be a three-dimensional substance. So imagine the layer above, excuse me, is also overlapping. So this is the way we like to think about metallic bonds. A whole bunch of cations surrounded by an electron C. So do you see the difference between this and an ionic bond? Where are the anions? The anions aren't there. So what is acting like the anion here? What is acting like the anion is the so-called electron C, the matrix of electrons that connects them all, kind of like a glue in every direction. But look at the advantage of this over ionic bonds. What would happen if I were to knock with a hammer, knock these copper atoms over just slightly, over by just say one ion, let's say, let's call them ions, knock them over by one. Well, no real difference. You'll still have copper next to copper on every side. What if I were to bend this, change its shape? No matter what I did, I'd pretty much still, unless I opened up a space in the middle, I'd have copper atoms next to copper atoms or copper cations next to copper cations. So it makes no difference. This is why metals have their properties. The properties of metals can be understood from the metallic bond. You know how you can bend a metal and bend it right back? You know how you can hammer a metal into a sheet, pull a metal into a wire. That's why we make wires out of metals. Why they conduct electricity and heat. Why did they conduct heat? Well, because they're really packed in close together. So if one of those starts shaking, the one right next to it starts shaking immediately, which transfers the heat very rapidly. And electrical conductivity, I'll get to in a moment. So I have my own metaphor. I actually came up with this one myself um, for thinking about metallic bonds. I like to think of metals as being shepherds. So keep in mind the word shepherd just means a sheep herder, someone who keeps track of a flock of sheep. It's kind of an old fashioned occupation, but there's still people that do it. Sometimes they'll replace the person now with a llama. If you've ever seen that out, in, if you're hiking in the mountains and you see a group of sheep, 
with a llama in the middle. That's because llamas are really tough and they, they become, they start thinking they're a sheep and they protect the flock from things like coyotes. Anyway, I think that's, that's always interesting. So these shepherds are keeping track of their sheep, but these are not good shepherds. They're not so bright, let's say. So I consider metals as being very similar to bad shepherds. See the blue shepherd on the left? Well, he's in charge of keeping track of his sheep. That's his job. He's got to know where his sheep are, keep track of them, not lose them. So he makes a little count and he says, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He's got them all. He's fine. And then the shepherd on the right, the red shepherd with the mustache, does the same exact thing. He, yep, all accounted for. So they both think they have their sheep. But think about this. If your flock of sheep is that close to another flock, how can you be sure about the ones in the middle? How do you know which flock they belong to? Does, do those two sheep in the middle that look sort of confused, do they belong to the shepherd on the left or the shepherd on the right? The shepherds aren't even sure. They're, they might be counting both of them as theirs. Who knows? They're just not good at their job. Well, this is what metals are like. Imagine the sheep are the electrons. Well, they've got most of their sheep in close, so they've got those. But their outer sheep, their outer electrons, they're not so sure about. It's kind of hard to say which flock, which atom they belong to. So let me replace them with silver ions. Silver has a positive one cationic charge. So if you have a silver ion, it's sort of missing an electron. Well, if you want to make it back to an atom, you got to add that electron back in. So if we draw a bigger circle, this would be a little exaggerated here. If we draw a bigger circle, we could include one of those electrons or maybe even both of them, okay? Turning the silver back into an atom, okay? But which silver, which AG, do those electrons belong to? The silver don't know, and the electrons don't know. That's what a metallic bond is like. The electrons in between are shared, not because each metal is pulling so hard on them, it's just because nobody is pulling very hard on them. No metal really has a very high electronegativity, and therefore, okay, well, there are exceptions, but let's just say, no metal really has a very high electronegativity, never gives those electrons much of a pull, so there's nobody fighting for them. So they're kind of up for grabs. Because they're up for grabs, they can move between the atoms like a little bit of a glue in every direction, and it doesn't matter if you shift those silver um, ions around, same thing. So here we see the inside of a piece of silver and I'm not really showing the electron count here. I'm just showing an electron C, like a whole bunch of electrons in the background as if it were like water, right? Notice I'm using that water template, okay? So metallic bonds are basically cations in an electron C. If you think about it this way, you can understand why they're such good electrical conductors. Do you see how if you popped in an electron anywhere, it could easily swim through that electron C? and pop out somewhere else? Of course it could, which is why metals conduct electricity. And because the valence shells are overlapping, the valence electrons are overlapping, that brings them close together, and that's why metals are dense. And that's also why they're good thermal conductors. They conduct heat. So many of the properties of metals can immediately be understood if you start thinking about metallic bonds this way. So notice in this diagram, I'm showing as if these valence electrons are going around their, let's say, parent cation, but really they don't quite do that. I'm just doing that to avoid confusion with the other ones. They can also swim freely. And then I'm showing just some randomly introduced electrons that are flying through the entire structure. So those would be the electrons that are being conducted electrically. They could make it anywhere. And in fact, to be honest, it doesn't really have to be the same electron that comes out the other side. If you pop in an electron into a piece of metal, you give the whole piece of metal a negative charge. So that negative charge can come out the other end almost instantly because you've transferred a negative charge to the entire body of the metal. So that really helps you understand why they conduct electricity once again. And this goes for all metals, even al, even aluminum. So think about aluminum foil. This is one of the metals that we come into contact with quite a lot. We've got aluminum cans, 
We've got aluminum foil. Aluminum is a very versatile metal. You might not realize there was a time when aluminum was more precious than gold. It was more pricey than platinum. Okay, up until around 1800, yes, it was extremely precious. People hoarded it, and whenever they could find some, they held onto it until they found a pretty cheap process of remo removing aluminum from rocks, and then they realized, well, aluminum is one of the most common metals on Earth. So actually, now it's super, super cheap. We toss it into the recycling bin without a worry, okay? So metallic bonds for aluminum. Well, aluminum has a positive three charge, okay? Um, if you notice where aluminum is, it's in a really interesting position because it's getting really close to the nonmetals. Its neighbors are actually metalloids, okay? Both above and to the right. It's got boron above it, and it's got silicon to the right. So it's interesting that aluminum is just barely making it into the metal category, and yet it follows all the rules of being a metal. It conducts electricity, conducts heat, okay, is malleable, is ductile. It has these properties. Okay, so aluminum has a positive three charge. So that means it has three valence electrons. Those valence electrons are all swimming in the electron C. So we picture the aluminum as the inner atom, as a cation, with the electron C being all the valence electrons, which is why aluminum foil is so flexible, okay, which is why it conducts heat so well, okay, it's why it's so practical for us. It's the metallic bond. So the properties of metals, many of them can be almost instantly explained if you just understand what metallic bonds are like, or at least our construct of them. Now keep in mind, metals are still technically atoms, so calling them cations is a way of thinking about them. They still have their valence electrons like right there. So they're still technically atoms. But because those valence electrons are shared, we like to think about them as the cations in the electron C. So the shiny metallic appearance, that's a hard one to explain. That, that We'd have to go down the rabbit hole to explain that one. That one I'm just going to skip. Sorry about that. But they're solid at room temperature. Why are they solid at room temperature? Because they stick together in every direction. They form large, massive, let's say, clusters of atoms, okay, chunks of metal, if you want to say. Because they're so big, well, they're not going to be, they're not going to be gases for sure. They're going to be too heavy to bounce around in the air, and it's going to be hard for them to be liquid because they are linked together in every direction. It's hard for them to sort of flow past each other. Of course, there is one that's not a solid. There is one metal that's not a solid at room temperature. And that is mercury. Mercury is the most exceptional metal because of that. And mercury has its own thing going on. If we had lots of time, we could go into detail about mercury, but we won't. They also have high melting points. That's why we cook in metal pans, pots and pans. And we use metal when we're cooking in the oven, okay? Or metal to hold things over a fire, okay? It's because metal is hard to melt, okay? It's also got a high density. Well, that's explained because they're overlapping valence shells, okay? And again, the high melting point, very similar to being a solid at room temperature. Those are obviously related because if it's hard to melt, well, you're going to be a solid. They have large atomic sizes. Well, this is the reason that they're metals. So if you really want to get down to it, why are they not pulling on those electrons very much? Why are they not trying to rein in their valence electrons, their outermost sheep. It's because they're big atoms. If you're a big atom, it's really difficult to pull on electromagnetically using Coulomb's law, using pulling on those valence electrons that are far away from you, okay? If you look at Coulomb's law, you'll see that attraction, electrical attraction, decreases with the distance very dramatically, with the square of the distance. So the farther you get, the less attraction. So if you're a big atom, that means your valence electrons are far from the nucleus. If they're far from the nucleus, they're not feeling it. They're not feeling that pull, which is why metals have low electronegativity. It's also why they have low ionization energy, the one right below that. That's because they're barely holding onto their electrons. It doesn't take much to knock them away. Just the slightest little bit of energy can remove those valence electrons, which is why they form cations. When they form ions, they form cations 
because their valence electrons get removed. That's one reason they're metals. Okay, and then it says low electronegativity. I just mentioned that. That means they're not pulling much on those on another electron that comes along. They don't want to get more electrons. If anything, they're going to lose the ones they have, their valence electrons. They're not likely to pick up a new electron. Come on. Why do they have high deformation? That means you can bend them. Why can? Because it doesn't matter if you shift the position slightly of the cations or dramatically. It's going to look the same if you just shift them around. It's all metallic bonds in every direction. There's no anions. There's no opposite charge there. So you can move them in different directions. And as long as they remain in contact, they all cling together. This is also why they are malleable. Notice that I have that arrow pointing to that little rolled up piece of platinum behind the writing. Well, how was that made? The platinum was hammered flat. It might have been melted, but if it wasn't, it was hammered flat into a sheet or pressed into a sheet by a machine and then rolled up. That's malleability. Why do metals do that? Because even if you hammer them thinner and thinner, they will cling together. It's even been seen, you can actually get a, a sheet of metal that is just one atom thick. It's very difficult to do it. A lot of times gold foil will be only a few atoms thick. That's one reason why it's so cheap. You might wonder, why is gold foil so inexpensive? It's because the gold is so thin. And then we have ductility. Being ductile is being capable of making a wire. Now, technically, you can make wires out of carbon nanotubing, uh, and that's a nonmetal. But other than that, metals are the ones that make wires. Okay? And of course, you can make plastics or coating of wires, but metals are the ones that make wires, let's just say. They conduct heat. We already mentioned why. They're packed close together. That's also why they have a high density. They're electrical conductors because of the electron C. Put in an electron, it can swim through the electron C and come out anywhere. So this explains, other than the shiny appearance, see that arrow is pointing to the background there. That's a piece of metal. Um, that's actually a bike post. I took a picture to get my metal background. I didn't like the backgrounds that Microsoft gives you, so I made my own. Um, the only one I didn't really explain at all was the shiny metallic appearance because that involves a little bit of relativity, gets a little complicated, um, and we don't really have time for that. And I didn't explain too much about mercury, but notice how many of the other ones you could easily explain just by thinking about metallic bonds. So in metallic bonds, the only thing that really changes is the size of the atom or the cation and the charge of the cation. So like with sodium, of course, as an alkali metal, it's got a positive one charge. Magnesium, which is an alkaline earth metal, has a positive two charge. So that means that each one of those is contributing two electrons to that electron C. And keep in mind, I'm not counting the electrons here. I just wanted to show it sort of like a background sea of electrons around them. Okay, magnesium has an interesting name origin. It actually is named after a portion of Greece that you may never have heard of. It is named after Magnesia, Greece. So magnesium was mined there. This is a part of Greece, I guess, where they have a lot of mines. And another metal was mined there, which was also named after the place, but its name got mangled over the years which is manganese. And then there's several other things that originate from this place name, like the word magnet, because lodestones were found in that area. I guess there's just lots of metal bearing um, rocks in this area, suppose, I guess. Otherwise, Magnesia Greece doesn't come up much in your history books. It's not that far from Thermopylae where the 300 fought, okay, where, where the Spartans fought. But it's interesting that Magnesia, this little part of Greece, gave its name to two of the elements on the periodic table. And it also gave its name to Milk of Magnesia, which is a magnesium compound. And there was some other weird theories back in the day before, um, before everybody was as scientific as they are today, where people thought there would be some sort of philosopher's stone that was based on those magnetic materials they mined there. So a lot of people were under the impression that if you just 
looked around enough there, you would find a stone of immortality. This was a real belief. It's kind of crazy now that you think about it. And that's what gave rise to um, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the first Harry Potter book. Oh yeah, well they changed the name in the US. They changed the name to Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone because they didn't think people would realize that it's about magicians, about sorcerers. Anyway, but that was the original name, the UK edition. And um, notice where Magnesia is, it's kind of north of Athens. And manganese didn't survive so well over the years, it got mangled in translation. And then the original magnets were actually made out of lodestones, which is sort of a natural occurring magnetite rock. Okay, which of course was named after Magnesia. So think about the magnet, the part of poly high, the magnet, right? That was named after Magnesia Greece too. Think about it. Calcium is another alkaline earth metal, also with a positive two charge. But notice it doesn't make too much difference which metal you're talking about. It just might have a different charge on the cation, but there's still cations swimming in an electron sea. So what I'm showing so far are just pure metals, like all calcium in this case, or before all magnesium, or before all sodium. And what about all gold? What do we call it when something is all gold, pure gold? We have a name for that. It doesn't come out of chemistry. It comes out from the jewelers that sell gold. They have a way of talking about it. They describe pure gold as 24 karat gold. So that's 24 out of 24. That's what that fraction is. So that's the same as 100% gold. So if you get 24 karat gold, then it's a bunch of gold atoms surrounded by their electron C and has that beautiful, unique, shiny gold appearance. But gold can be shaped. And in fact, gold in many ways is one of the more useful metals. It's just a shame that it's so expensive, okay? Because it is a very, very useful metal and also it doesn't react much. It's one of those noble metals. Remember those? The metals that don't react much. Notice that gold is AU. That comes from the Latin name aurum. So pretty much any element that has an old Latin name and a symbol on the periodic table that comes from that is probably something that people knew about, let's say, a thousand years ago. It's not a recently discovered element. All the recently discovered ones are going to have names, have symbols on the periodic table, just like their name in English. So AU comes from aurum, which is the Latin word for gold. But what if it's not pure gold? What if it's got some other metals mixed in it? There's nothing stopping this because metallic bonds can happen between any two metals. Or in this case, three metals, I guess. So you could just swap out some of the gold with some silver, swap out some of the gold with some copper. Interestingly, both of those also are exceptions to English. AG, Argentum, come, that comes from its Latin name, Argentum, which is the ancient name for silver. And CU comes from Cuprum, which is the Latin name for copper. Okay. So interestingly, um, if you mix those three exceptions to English, which are all noble metals together, what do you get? You get 14 karat gold. Well, depending on the mixture. If the mixture is right, you get a 14 karat gold. So notice that is not pure gold anymore. Anything less than 24 is not going to be pure gold. Like 12 karat gold would be 50% gold. Get it? Now, some people think that people just get 14 karat gold just because it's less expensive, because silver is a little less expensive than gold, and copper is less expensive than silver. So if you do this, it lowers the price a bit, but it also reinforces the metal. Because it turns out by having more than one kind of metal, you get the benefit of all of their properties. Usually, almost always, if you mix metals in what is called an alloy, what you get is something better than any of the metals on their own. This has been known since ancient times. Okay, they started doing this and it really was one of the things that developed society, developed civilization. So 14 karat gold is actually in many ways better than 24 karat gold. It's harder, it's less likely to bend or dent, okay? The only thing it's not better at is being unreactive. Gold does a better job on its own, 24 karat gold, of being unreactive. 
And then of course you can have pure copper. Well, copper itself is getting pretty pricey these days. The price of copper has been rising because they use it in so many more things nowadays. So many electronics require copper for them to work correctly. So the price of copper has been going up, but if you've got pure copper, well, that's great. You can make great wires out of it. You could make the Statue of Liberty out of it. Oh yeah, the Statue of Liberty is made out of copper. Doesn't look like it, does it? Okay. But copper will bend really easily. It's not a very hard material. I wonder what would happen if we mixed something into it? What if we mixed another metal into it while it was still molten and then let it form an alloy? Well, this was a great idea that led to a major development in civilization. So first of all, I forgot to mention where the word copper comes from. Copper is a corruption of the name of the island of Cyprus, which used to be called Kupros, which sounds a little bit more like Kuprum, which sounds a little bit more like copper. Okay, This was an island off the coast of Turkey and Lebanon where copper was mined for thousands of years. That's where the Egyptians got it. That's where the Sumerians got it. That's where the Phoenicians got it. The Greeks got it. Pretty much everybody got it from that island. So they just started calling it by the name of the island. So the word copper is a very slightly modified version of the name of the island of Cyprus. And then Cyprus, of course, Cyprus itself was named after the tree, the Cypress tree, which is kind of like a juniper tree. Like see those in the bottom right? Those are Italian Cypress. Those are the trees they make telephone poles out of, by the way, because they grow so straight, okay? So the island was named after the tree, the metal was named after the island, and everybody thinks pennies are made of copper, but if you remember from the nitric acid demo, they are not made of copper, they just look like it. They have a very thin coating on the outside. 2.5% of the penny is actually copper. The rest of it is zinc. And then, of course, nickels, dimes, and quarters, which don't look like copper, well, they are primarily made of copper, especially dimes and quarters, 92% copper, but they have a coating, so they don't look like copper. So the, the coins that we think are made of copper are not, and the coins we don't think are made of copper actually are. It's kind of bizarre. It's just because people want to keep a penny looking the way it does. And as I said, the Statue of Liberty was made of copper on the outside, just the shell, just the coating. And for a few years, possibly as long as 10 years, it was copper colored until it oxidized, it reacted with the oxygen and it turned the patina green that we know it as today, the familiar Statue of Liberty, Planet of the Apes green that it turned. Um, so by the way, photography back then was black and white. So even when you see a picture that shows when it was copper, it's kind of hard to tell. This picture has been colorized. It's a colorized version of a black and white picture. But copper can be made better. What if we mix in a little bit of tin? Tin has the symbol SN on the periodic table for stannum, that's the ancient name for it. Tin was a very important metal and it was increasingly important the farther back you go in history. But even until fairly recently, we, we use a lot more tin foil, tin cans. Now it has been largely replaced by other metals like aluminum in our everyday life because now the tin is more expensive, okay? Um, tin also has an interesting property of being magnetic. So if you want something to be magnetic, you can make it out of tin and that's a good substitute for iron. Okay, but it turns out if you mix tin with copper, you get an alloy. This alloy was so important, it triggered an age of civilization, the Bronze Age. So notice that bronze has a Z, but tin, the symbol for tin starts with an S, S-M. Just remember that. And let's look at another alloy of copper, another alloy that's pretty useful, maybe not quite as useful as bronze. Like for example, bronze you can make really good cookware out of, you can make um, swords out of, helmets, armor. It's going to be much, much harder than making it out of copper alone. Then there is also brass. Now brass is kind of like copper, it's mostly copper, but it's got zinc mixed in with it. Now notice that brass 
has two S's, has the S, but zinc has the Z. So this is how I like to remember the difference between bronze and brass. Bronze has a Z, but the symbol for the element mixed with copper doesn't, it has an S, and brass has an S, but the symbol for the element mixed with the copper doesn't have an S, it has a Z. So it's like they're reversed. It's almost like the names would have been easier if they had switched them around. So brass, you can make statues out of and things like that, but it's not gonna stand up to as much punishment as bronze. So we don't have a, an age of civilization named after brass. So one surprising drawback to the metallic bond, even though it does so many great things, is that it provides too much flexibility. That's why metals have high deformation. They can bend very easily. So iron is a great metal, Fe, ferrum, another exception to English, another one that has been known since ancient times. Iron is great, but if you try to build something that's too big out of iron, something that's big, like let's say a building, well then the iron is gonna start bending and you'll have a really hard time keeping that iron structure from deforming. So they found a solution to this. It was to make an alloy. So look at this alloy. What does this have in it? Well, it's mostly iron. Oh, but it's got carbon in it. So what do we call this, an iron carbon alloy? We call this steel. So do you think carbon is gonna make a metallic bond with the iron? Why am I not showing the carbon as an ion? Because actually the carbon does not form metallic bonds. Carbon is a non-metal. Non-metals don't make metallic bonds. So what you wind up getting just around the carbon is you wind up getting four covalent bonds. Iron is one of those exceptional metals that will form covalent bonds with certain non-metals. And so because the carbon grabs onto four surrounding iron, that, prevent, that pro produces like a little um, spur in the iron, sort of a little jam, which prevents the iron atoms from sliding past it. If you have enough carbon spread out throughout the iron, maybe about 2% is usually what they use, then suddenly that iron becomes much, much stiffer, much less likely to bend. It actually makes it stronger in the long term as well. So they found this long ago when they discovered how to make steel that by injecting a small amount of carbon, either hammering it into the actual iron or putting it in when the iron was molten, when it was actually hot enough to become a liquid, you could make a much stronger material and that is steel. So by the way, we would never have buildings like you see in downtown LA, like we have in downtown Chicago, New York, or all the many, many cities around the world. I guess Singapore has big, big buildings now in Tokyo. You would never get those without steel because no metal is gonna be stiff enough to prevent bending over such a great distance. So that's why steel is so useful. The problem with steel is that it will react with oxygen and you'll get a coating of rust. So they came up with a solution for that or a partial solution. It turns out if you add a little bit of chromium into the mix, chromium, by the way, the name of the element chromium means colorful. It has a very shiny appearance, like they call it a chrome surface, um, which reflects a lot of light. So I guess that's colorful. It also makes colorful compounds. Um, if you mix in a little chromium, then the oxygen, instead of reacting with the iron, will take the chromium first, protecting the iron structure, which actually makes the steel last longer. They call this stainless steel. Now, stainless steel isn't truly stainless. It will, of course, eventually react with oxygen, but just a small amount of chromium makes a big difference in its lifespan, how long it will last before reacting with surrounding elements. It doesn't have to be oxygen. Oxygen is just the most present reactive element around us in the air, but it could react with things like, let's say it's going into the ground, materials that are in the ground or in the rocks as well. So those are the end of the notes on metallic bonds.